I've always just thought, well, you know what, I'm going to do the right things. Working extremely hard is, is a given for me. I'll have a staff around me who work really hard. We'll try and do the right things for the players and the team and have really good processes in place. Kieran, thanks for having us in, You're welcome. first and foremost. So, it's coming up to a year in charge, second in the league, best start to a season in 53 years. Um, how would you sum up what you've seen and done so far with Ipswich? I think I'd, I'd say I've really enjoyed it. You know, it's been a, it's been a good year for me personally. I've, I've settled in the area, mm. I've settled in the club. It, um, it feels like home, my family are settled and um, you know, we, we've really enjoyed our time here, I think. We've made really good strides on and off the pitch as a club. You know, I think some of that started before I arrived mm-hmm. um, with the, the change of ownership and um, the investment and the work that's going on behind the scenes. And um, of course, my part coming in is to come in and, and help that as well and, and give my ideas on how we can improve the football club, but also to improve and develop the players and, and help the team. And I think we've managed to do that. I think we're in a, in a good place, a better place than we were this time last year. But in terms of what we've done, probably the short answer is, is nothing. <laughs> um, you know, we've had a, a, a good start to the season. We, we finished last season with some really good performances and give ourselves a foot in. We've carried that into this year, but we're, we're not even halfway through a season yet and there's a long way to go. And um, We've got big goals for the football club, not just for this season, but for the seasons beyond that. And um, I think it's really early days on that and I think it's, it's just about keeping the head down and, and continuing that work, which so far has been fruitful and enjoyable. What was your perception or knowledge of League One before you came and actively, now pretty much right in the middle of the job, mm-hmm. with regards to what you've seen so far in your coaching career? Has, has it been what you expected? Was there a different perception of it in your head before you got here? I think it's um, you have a good, a good grasp on the, the level and the, the level of the players because... You know, working in academies, you get so many players who go out to this level. You get players who go beyond this level, but you get really good players come out of academies who don't make it to this mm. level. So you know that there's a good level of player there. Um, you know that there's some really big football clubs. Anyone can look at the table and see the likes of an Ipswich Town or a Derby County or a Sheffield Wednesday mm. amongst others and know that there's, there's big football clubs there with big infrastructures. Um, and I've been out to watch, you know, plenty of League One games over the years, especially again watching players who've been out on loans from mm-hmm. academies or when I was with, um, of course, the first team United players on loan at League One as well. So you've seen matches, but you don't get a feel for the league until until you're in it. You don't get a feel for the challenges. I've learned a lot about the the challenges of this league, the mm-hmm. different oppositions, the the conditions, the referee, and the, all the different elements that that make a league unique. Mm-hmm. And um, I think it's really hard to get a feel for that league, whether it's the Premier League or the Bundesliga or League One, until you're in that league and you're living it every week. And um, I feel like we're there now. I feel like that's one area that myself and, and certainly my staff as well are miles ahead now in terms of understanding the requirements of the league and, and the different types of games you're going to face. But that's definitely been a, been a learning curve over the last 12 months. From the media perspective, from our point of view, when we talk about teams and managers and coaches, it's, it's always... Um, a point of focus, the, the age of a manager or the mm. relative youth of a manager, which in classic managerial terms, you would be at the younger end of that spectrum. But in coaching terms, mm. there's years and years and years and years under your belt. Obviously, having come through a system, having to retire through injury at 22, I believe, mm-hmm. which is very desperately young for any footballer looking to try and make it as a career. Yeah. Is, is there a seed sown there when you have to draw a line under playing that says I want to still make it in this game and this is my next port of call yeah yeah I think that's very much the process that I went through really obviously was it an emotional time when that happened it was um, my injury was a chronic one which I do think no one boys that have been through similar experiences that that is a little bit different so I started getting the first hip problems at sort of 20 years old when I was really close to the first team at Tottenham and in and around it and and career in a good pathway and then had over two years of surgeries mm-hmm. and setbacks and um, difficult moments so you you have a little bit more time to prepare for it and 
you know, of course, first surgery, you, you, you're 100% you know, assuming when you'll be back and you're itching to get back. But as, as time went on and I was struggling to overcome the problem, um, in the back of the mind, you, you become mentally a little bit more prepared for, you know, I might not make it back from this one. Yeah. And what would you want to do next? Um, I think my, co my coaches from, I even remember the late Jimmy Neighbour, um, it was my youth team coach, but as a 16 year old coming over from Ireland within mm -hmm. a couple of months, saying to me that you, you'll definitely be a coach, you'll be a very good coach. And, he saw um, that that yeah, young? Yeah, at 16, yeah. Did he, did he explain how we'd seen that? Um, you no, you? no, I don't remember him, him saying how, I just remember us having a conversation with, with Jimmy and him saying to me, you know, at 16, I think you, you'll definitely be a coach, you'll go on a coach. And um, Patsy Holland, um, was the youth team manager then of the second years in the under 19s mm. as it was then. And I think very similar, always sort of giving me leadership roles and, and seeing that in me and mm. um, tended to be captain of, of most of the teams that I played for and um, internationally as well. So I think that was something that people always seen in me. I didn't see it myself, um, but people saw it in me. And um, of course then when, as you say, you finish early with injury, you're at a crossroads and I looked up different avenues and um, there's downsides to being football as well. I'd sacrificed a lot at a young age, you know, to move to England and come away from family and mm. friends and um, looked at different avenues in education and different career paths. But I think deep down I, I knew that I'm, I'm so, and always have been since such a young age, so um, obsessed with football <laughs> and such a deep love for it that mm. that was always going to be the the calling and you know I got some good advice and some good people give me a foot up towards the coaching ladder mm -hmm. and um, as soon as I made that decision there was there was no stopping really and it was it was all in and from the first days that I did it I loved it and um, I've been on that journey ever since. Did it feel obviously you get medical um, advice and you get the advice of physios and, and, and potentially management and, and coaches as well but given it was a chronic injury. Did it feel like when it, the time came, it was your decision to say, enough's enough? Yeah, I think that was taken out of my hands in the end, okay. which is probably a good thing because when I woke up from the last surgery, the mm. surgeon was standing there telling me enough's enough. Really? Wow. Yeah, so um, it was taken out of my hands and that was probably for the best because I was, I was so deterred, I'd still be getting surgeries now yeah. if you could get me out there playing. <laughs> so it was the best thing in the end that it was taken out of my hands mm. and then, or not taken out of my hands, of course, you can always you know, you have ownership over your own decisions, but the advice become so strong that, mm -hmm. you know, I knew it was not the right course of action. Um, so it, it um, as you say, because it was chronic, I had time to prepare, I'd already started to think about the what ifs. And um, again, the, the surgeon spoke to me after the surgery and within a week, I was out on the pitch in crutches, um, working with Alex Inglethorpe and John McDermott yeah. with a super talented Tottenham youth team and um, watching and learning and uh, trying to help out and, and had the bug for it from then. That sense of moving away from that then, because my understanding when I speak to a lot of players of, of and we, we probably are borderline just about the same generation of, of, of when we started our careers, there have been a lot of similarities, but those ones that have perhaps played football for a long time and then gone into coaching after it, the thing that seems to hit some of them like a bus is, is the the educational side of it, mm -hmm. because you do have to relearn, you've got to yeah. retrain, you've got to wait, because you can't just go from playing football to, I know, I can put a session on. Because yeah, we've yeah. all seen players yeah. that can do that, yeah, uh, well, that think they can do that, yeah, and you see it in absolute yeah. mile off. So yeah. then, is, so just give us a, a, a sense of what it means then. You go from playing and training three, four hours a day, if you're in rehab, you've got different things to do to get back fit and you've made that decision, you've got to move on. Yeah. Is, it, is it uni? I know you went to Loughborough. Is, yeah. is it remote learning? Is it every single day you've got to do something different? Yeah, I think the base requirement, of course, is your badges. Mm. So the PFA were great with that, as they are with, with ex-players. Had you do any of those so, before um, injury? I think as, as, a, as a base in your scholarship, if you're at a Premier League academy, then mm. you do your level one and two mm -hmm. as, as such, um, or your level one. So... Um, the first port of call, of course, is your badges, and the club were great with that, the PFA were great mm. with that. There was Les Ferdinand, or Sir Les, and, and Tim Sherwood were both starting on the coaching badges at that stage as well, so the PFA put on a little course for us at Tottenham to get through that one, and then you, you're getting onto your B licence and your other badges. So the first um, port of call is, of course, the education on that side of it, but then there's so much more to it than that, and mm. the formal learning that you get on those courses is good, but it's, it's really absolutely fractional compared to all the, 
the knowledge and information and experiences that are out there you have to get. So for me, it was, um, you know, about working with the coaches at Tottenham, about speaking to coaches at other clubs, about um, going on international tournaments, which we've done as Tottenham's Academy, to study, you know, European teams and styles of play and mm -hmm. systems. It was um, about watching an awful lot of games at the highest level to, to study trends um, and gaining as many different um, perspectives on you know, first of course, of course, the football things and the technical, tactical things, but then of, of the whole scheme of things that might be involved in football coaching, and that's when um, the decision to come to Loughborough come into play. Mm -hmm. um, I knew I could have stayed on at Tottenham for a lot of years and been a coach for the academy and um, stayed in that system. Mm -hmm. But again, good advice really. Said go leave there for a few years, go elsewhere, study, study other things, study. Sports science, physiology, pedagogy, all the different aspects that, that can help you in your coaching career and mm. go and work at some other clubs. So I'd done that and, and spent a few years um, more so away from Tottenham and, and spent some time in the States and mm -hmm. in Canada. I worked at Nottingham Forest in their academy and um, you know got a whole range of experiences that, that set me up really well um, for eventually then coming back into Tottenham and continuing that journey. So Jenny then from Tottenham moves on to well, Tottenham's a very big club, onto mm -hmm. a, a club that's a, an absolute kind of beast, isn't it, in Manchester United. Is, is there a, was there a fan element to that? Did I, did, is that part of a correct bit of uh, information that, I've, that yeah. I've got? Yeah, yeah, I think that was, um, you know, that was part of it. It's, it's a, of course, a massive and great club anyway, but I grew up as a Man United fan um, with a Liverpool brother, so I <laughs> was always passionate about the, the club and that... Um, that was always a, a goal that I wrote down, you mm. know, in my, oh, to, to, in my to, diaries. To, yeah, to get them yeah, to, to work put there. it on paper oh. to, to work for Man United. Um, so that was always an, an ambition from when I started off my coaching career. And um, when that opportunity came, you know, it was it was fantastic for me and not one that you uh, take too long to think about. And is there a, if, obviously if you're a Spurs fan, you might not agree with this, but is there a difference between what Tottenham is and what Manchester United is? Once you kind of open the doors and get inside the Yeah, party. I think, look, to be... Tottenham is, is growing and developing at a great rate as a club. Mm. So um, Tottenham now in terms of the, the stadium, the training oh, ground a, and um, stadium, everything. It's yeah. been Champions League football mm. for you know quite a lot of recent years. So it's a club on a great path that has you know, done really well over the last um, decade to, to grow the club. When I arrived at Tottenham, you know, training ground, stadium, everything was it was a different scale. Mm. Um, but yeah, there's no doubt about it going to, to Manchester, the... Um, again, the infrastructure behind the scenes, but most importantly, or probably more significantly, the, the interest, the, um, the following, mm. the, the messages from everyone you know, <laughs> the messages from everyone you don't know. Yeah. Um, the, the sheer scale of the club is, is on another level to almost any other in world football. So that, that's certainly one thing that hits you when you go there. But probably more importantly, it hits you when you go there is that it was a, a club that really still had that family feel a lot of staff in the academy especially who'd worked there for a lot of years mm -hmm. that you know were really um, great influences on the pathway of young players that they've had there and you felt like you were coming into a, a club with great history and tradition that they've done a lot of things in a good way. Of course when you talk about the, the type of people that were there <clears throat> when you get someone like Jose Mourinho who is the, the, the kind of terminology is box office isn't it because mm -hmm. of A the, the man himself the manager and what he's won um, for, he, for him to then come and say Kieran, you're in the building. I want you to come and, well, basically work alongside mm. him. How how does that go? You from from meeting him to that discussion about you actually coming and being part of his team because it, it does seem it's it's behind the curtain, isn't it? It's it's a very yeah. select few that get a chance to work with him. Yeah, and to be fair, Jose has been been great with that. I think through his career, you know, at um, Chelsea, for example, and the likes of Steve Holland, mm. or, um, you know, different younger coaches who he's he's sort of taken with him over his career and, and had part of his staff so um, you know he doesn't do that lightly and again worked under I'd worked under him for a couple of years as academy coach mm -hmm. when he was first team manager but of course you have some interaction but not loads of interaction mm -hmm. but thankfully he'd been you know watching quite a few of the sessions and I'd, I'd like things that he'd seen and heard mm -hmm. and um, was, is, was is willing there, to. Is there a sense of that the, the manager such as Jose is like the all seeing eye of that so you might be working with the academy, these younger players, mm -hmm. but it's like playing a football match. There's always somebody watching yeah, somewhere, isn't yeah, there? Yeah, yeah, it's very, very true. Um, I think United is well set up for that um, because, you know, very cleverly, the manager's office is 
on the apex of the building and big glass windows and you've got the first team <laughs> pitches that side and the, the academy pitches on the other wow. side, which I'm sure from Sir Alex was, you know, intentional yeah. and able to oversee everything. So very often we would be training on the pitches and the manager's offices there and I'm sure could, wow. you know, sit and watch training. But you're not thinking about that when you're doing it. Mm. So I guess, as you said, the important lesson is is there on, um, there's always somebody watching and um, for me, my philosophy has always just been, you know, do your job as well as you can um, and your reputation internally will, will look after itself and um, thankfully that was that was the case and, and mm-hmm. I built up a good reputation inside the club for the work with the with the younger players and that was something that Jose has shown an interest in and um, given me the, the first opportunity in the senior game. And is it a sense of when you work with a man like that, is he magnanimous enough to know that times change and people progress and different generations come through and it is it a peer-to-peer conversation that you would have with regards to training and, and the the involvement and the management of players yeah i think you, you going in as a new staff member probably with any manager you have to earn the trust mm. first and foremost so um he's very open with his staff and again has been at all the different clubs mm. um so he's very open and honest at the start with this is what I want, this is what I need you to do and um, really clear with it and your responsibilities are, are really clear with Jose. Uh, but I think when you were in the trust then the, the conversations can shift a little bit and maybe once your opinion more you can discuss things more on a, on a level. Um, of course you're respectful in that position as a, as a young coach for a mm-hmm. man who's won so many titles and Champions League titles and you, um, you know, you're respectful with your opinions. Um, but he, he was always open with his staff and um, wanted input and ideas, but ultimately was, was really strong and he's the ultimate decision maker and, and one of the most important aspects is, as the first team staff is that once he's made the decision, everyone's behind it 100% mm. and you, um, you follow his way and, and that's what we look to do. And when it's that kind of moving forward side of it, do, do you take bits from the people that you've worked with? You mentioned um, coming through at, at Spurs and in at Nottingham Forest and at Loughborough. It's, it's not necessarily just these stellar names that you take bits from. Is it people across the board that you've met as you kind of yeah. work your way through your career? What, what, so, in, so in that end, mm-hmm. if, is, is, is there any, any bullet points that you take from a Jose Mourinho about how to run a football club, be it the head of a football club like you are now? Yeah, I think it's it's seeing the different ways that people do it. And um, Jose's management style was was similar to certain man- I worked under AVB at Tottenham mm. when I was um youth team coach, so there's similarities there, of course. Got to see Pochettino a lot up close and, and worked um he was really interested in the academy, so saw through his year to Harry Redknapp's years to, you know, such a different scale. And they've all got different ways of running and managing mm. a football club. Um Harry Redknapp was very different to VS Boas, mm. who was not too different to Jose in some aspects, who might be different to Pochettino. So um, there's different ways of doing it and I think you have to be true to your own personality. I think Jose manages in a way that feels comfortable with his personality and is fantastic at doing it and um, a Pochettino will manage off of what his values and his beliefs are. And um, It's great getting that different exposure to those different people but ultimately I think you have to do the job true to yourself and, mm. and your own personality and what you believe in and, and how you want to be every day and how you want to influence the people around you. So. Um, I've took a lot from each of them. Mm-hmm. Like you say, it's not just the big names. You take you know, bits from people you work with in academies, people you work with. We, we worked in, in non-league at Loughborough with mm. um, Stuart McLaren, who was, who was a good influence on me um, in, in, the, in that setting and, and learn things from him. So you learn things from everyone, but ultimately you have to you know, be true to yourself and, and really reflect on what you believe in, how you want to be, how mm-hmm. you want to manage and how you want your teams to play on the pitch. So obviously, coming towards the latter stages of being at, at Manchester United with Jose going out and yourself and Michael Carrick working with Ole Gunnar Solskjaer and then Ralph Ranjit coming in. Um, again, that, that, that sense of what that club is with regards to the people coming in and out, it, it feels like there's almost like a fraternal bond because obviously we've seen Michael going at Borough. Mm-hmm. Is, is, he a, is he a former colleague that you keep in touch with? Yeah, yeah, he's, um, I'd, I'd categorise him as a close friend now, mm-hmm. which is... Uh, which is really nice, and um, yeah, as you say, it's um, look, it's it's a fantastic football club. Um, it's had good times and bad times, like every football club does. Um, but there's some great people there, and you know, one of the, the nicest things about leaving there was 
able to leave there on really good terms. Obviously, the Oli had did a did a, fa a really good job there, in my opinion, and mm. had some really good years and back to back Champions Leagues and got the the place on a good footing. Um, unfortunately, didn't didn't um, end in good form as, as happens when the manager changes. Um, it was nice on a personal level to, to finish there on really good terms and to be able to help. Um, Ralph get off and running in his first few weeks and, and mm -hmm. pick up some results and leave in, in a good place with the team winning and, in, and most importantly in good terms with everybody and with good relationships um, that have built up with staff and players and, and people at all levels of the club and relationships that are still really nice to have today. So that's the past. The current obviously is Ipswich. They come knocking of December, uh, in December of last year. What, what was it about Ipswich, did you know there was interest? Did you know it was coming on the horizon? Were you, were you in your mind, ready? I, I, I think I could give being a boss a crack here. Were you, are you always ready for that next step? No, I, I don't think you're always ready. I, I wasn't ready uh, or I, I mentally wasn't prepared for 32, for mm. example, or 33. I always had in my head that, you know, in around 35, um, from, from quite early in my career, actually, um, probably because it's in the right normal retirement age. Mm. And I thought, well... You know what, if I'd have played from 22 onwards, I probably would have finished maybe around 35 typically, and then that would have been the time to to look at those things. So I wanted to gain as much experience and exposure mm. as I could and um, develop my skills as a coach primarily as much as I could. But I knew that if I was going to be a manager, I wanted to do it young. I wanted to, to go out and do it at, at 35, maybe 36, and, and have a real good go at it young. Um, so that season, I knew whether I went in that off season or at the end of the season or whenever the time was right, I knew that if the right opportunity came, then it would be something I'd look at. Mm -hmm. I knew I was, um, you know, really well respected internally at Man United and had um, had a future there and had a, a good job at a great club. But I, I also knew that that was the time that I wanted to go out on my own two feet. Um, as and when the, the right opportunity came up and of course you don't know when that's going to be sometimes it's more convenient if that comes at the end of the season because yeah. you you can um, finish up or, or close the book of the job that you're doing and, and move in the summer but for me it come yeah a week or two before Christmas and <laughs> happen really quickly and you're, you're packing the bags and having Christmas day in the hotel with the family um, <laughs> well the family were here though they were here oh, for okay. Christmas yeah thankfully <laughs> you well, the, the sat game, here on your own yeah no I wasn't sat here on my own so um, yeah, I, I knew it was the right time mm. in and around it, whether it was six months later or three months later. I, I knew I didn't want to be a first-team coach for another two or three seasons. Mm. I felt like I'd worked under really good managers, um, had been given great responsibility within those setups, and now I wanted to go out and, and do it for myself. And mm -hmm. um, it was waiting for that right opportunity, and, and thankfully Ipswich was the, the one that came along that I thought was, was really good for me. So you go from part of being of the delegation to being head of the delegation mm -hmm. and people are suddenly all eyes are turned on you now for all the answers rather than being one of a couple that have got mm -hmm. suggestions for the manager how's that transition been has it felt like you thought it would yeah yeah that bit I've, I've found fine to be honest um, I've enjoyed that bit again I think when you're you know academy and, and first team is different in, in some ways of course but it's not as different as people think and mm. when you've been youth team manager at Man United and at Tottenham you're picking a team every week, you're deciding on setups every week, you're, you're putting people in the team, you're leaving people out of the team, you're making decisions, mm -hmm. you're managing the support staff. So on a much lower scale, but I'd, I'd had the, the lead role in some big, big football clubs, um, just on the academy setting. Um, and then when you've been through, yeah, um, you know, the, the scale of working as first-team coach at Man United, you're involved in a lot of really, really big decisions. And... Um, yeah, it, it felt right and it feels natural. I'd say it's, it's nice in some ways having the final decision. Of course, there's certain <laughs> decisions that, you know, you missed the days where you can sit back as an assistant and think, oh, I want to be the manager that. picking this one. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't have done that. Or, oh, I wouldn't want to have to make that call because yeah. it's a really close one yeah. and you're not sure what your, your decision would be. Um, so there's the very, very odd decision where you think, oh, don't fancy making that one. But in general... There's the, the nice clarity and uh, I guess reassurance that you know you have the criteria what you make your decisions on mm -hmm. and for me that's you know trying to do things in the right way, treat people in the right way and ultimately do what's best for the team and mm -hmm. you make those decisions and um, some you get right, some you get wrong and, and a lot of time in football you're never going to know whether it's right or wrong because mm -hmm. um, the result often dictates the narrative and mm. decides whether you're right or wrong but in reality football's a 
a random low scoring event and um, <laughs> whether it goes in or out of the post yeah. doesn't always determine whether your decision was It's right a great or USP, wrong. isn't it? A random yeah. low scoring yeah. event. <laughs> yeah. Um, it is, it is. It's, it's a football match. You think, did I pick the right team? Did I not pick yeah, the right yeah. team? Did we do the right things in training? Did I say the right things in a meeting? The margins might be, might be that. So That's a lot um, to think, though, because that, that must yeah. dominate your headspace more often than not because you, you, there's managing there's micromanaging then there's taking responsibility for everything and as we know in football mm. there's only there's only one person that gets to blame when things yeah, aren't yeah. so great it's the manager yeah exactly so i think that's perspective then and i guess really early on in my management career or before i was a manager i've always just thought well you know what i'm going to do the right things working extremely hard is, is a given for me mm. um I'll have a staff around me who work really hard. We'll try and do the right things for the players and the team and have really good processes in place and try and not lose sleep or, um, you know, ruin your, ruin your week off of, you know, a hurling in a football match. Mm. Of course, the result is the be-all and end-all. It affects at Ipswich, 30,000 people in the stadium, how their weekend's going to yeah. be. But I think in this position, you need to keep perspective in it and you need to know and I need to know going to bed at night every week and, and certainly on a Saturday night that I've done everything what I can in the build up to that game to help the players and done what I could of course during the match to help the players and after mm -hmm. that um, what will be will be. It's amazing the way you talk about that and when you talk about coaches that came across you as a younger pro and saying we could see you being a manager. Now sitting here and, and, and seeing your interviews and watching your teams you don't strike me as a screamer and a shouter, mm. you sound very methodical uh, reports talk about how well prepared you are, but flexible. Um, how you are meticulous in your approach, but very adaptable as well. How much of that have you taught yourself? How much of that has been stuff that you've picked up? And how much of that do you think is just naturally who Kieran McKenna is as a person? Yeah, it's a good, um, it's a good question. Um, I think my nature has always been to be extremely thorough in everything that I've done. Um, you know, whether that was in school, education, any different sports you play as a kid. Um, I've always been thorough in terms of giving absolutely everything and doing the best possible job I can at everything. So I think the preparation and the thoroughness has always come from that. I think your influences are, are important. I especially think as a coach, your early influences are mm. really important. I think the first managers who you work under, the first coaches who you work under, and I've said it before, I, I come into Tottenham's academy um, which had always been a really good academy. Um, mm. I come into it at a time when, um, again, Alex Fingelfort was was 32, maybe 33, which was extremely young at that stage as a youth team boss. With John McDermott, who's of course gone on to be um, technical director of the FA, mm -hmm. Chris Ramsey, Tim Sherwood in around the 23 squad. Um, in a time when Tottenham's academy was operating at a really high level and there was a, a level of planning and... Um, thought that went into everything that was mm -hmm. was um, higher than what was going on elsewhere at that time, I think, and certainly mm -hmm. way above what I thought was even possible. So that was my early exposure to how you do coaching and straight away it was like, oh, this is a really serious profession mm -hmm. and you have to um, take care of all the small details and do all the right things. So that was just the way I learned to do it from the off. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's a mixture. It's the experiences and the people that you're exposed to. It's your own personality and your own... Um, your own inclination to how you do certain things and um, personality wise I think I have you know I've got a, a, a temper side as well um, <laughs> that you know can be attested to by a few a few <laughs> references but I think I, I made the conscious decision from I guess my experiences as well as a player of you know I'll assume the best of players I will assume that they're um, I will give them trust and give them faith until that point's broken. Mm -hmm. And in that way, then the, most of my job will be trying to help and facilitate their learning and their performances. And I think most of the time players respond better to, you know, being given reasonable feedback and a mm -hmm. plan towards um, doing better and improving and developing in their careers. And I try and work in that way and um, keep fairly level with it. And, mm -hmm. and as we do with the team, with individuals, stick to the, the plan and I can try and help them along the way and know that that will help the team. So, yeah, a mixture of everything. I mm. think your experience is your personality and probably also a, a bit of a conscious decision of how you decide to do the job. It does feel like there's a bit of a shift as well. I think there's two managers that are in the sixes in the 92 league clubs. 18 are in the 30s. So, I mean, 
in a sense, you look at, I mean, the team that you're duking out with at the top of League One, Stephen Schumacher, mm. another young manager. We've seen Neil Critchley at Blackpool, of course, and we see Cooper, the work that he's done with both Swansea and Nottingham Forest, Russell Martin as well. Um, it, is there, I mean, maybe it's not, so, given how, how hectic and how all-consuming being a boss of one football mm -hmm. club is, maybe to not think about it in that broader scheme of where it's moving to. Brendan Rodgers in the past, yeah. of course, coming through a, diff a different way, not that necessarily ex-pro goes into management. Um, it really shines a light on vocational coaches, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Men that have studied, people that have studied to become as good as possible in their particular field. Mm -hmm. um, do, is, is there a sense of possibly leading the way for these players that perhaps don't quite make it, that have to retire through injury, that you can show them? Because there was always that finger pointed, particularly more so at the Premier League, of managers from these shores and across yeah. the water that um, perhaps don't get the chances. Are, are we seeing a, a culture shift, do you feel? Um, I think the, the trend would look that way. I think in terms of being a trendsetter, it's, it's not something, of course, that you think about. Um, but it would be lovely to know that you give you know, somebody hope out there because um, I think, I guess if I say for me or my generation, you, you're always following after the generations come before you. Mm -hmm. and I think you, you're standing on the shoulder of giants in a way and, and a couple of the names you've mentioned, the, the likes of Jose mm -hmm. who um, you know, come through with a, you know, a, a non-big playing background and went on to you know, manage massive football clubs mm -hmm. and, and make a huge impact on English football in general and then um, Brendan Rodgers again who mentioned maybe when he and, and I've had some really good conversations with him and when he was making his first steps it probably wasn't as as normal as it is now mm -hmm. for a young manager to get an opportunity or a young coach to progress in the game a young British coach so I think um, us of us who are who are coming along in the pathway now we're following on the shoulders of, of people who've, who've made that big impact and hopefully broken down their boundaries and known that you know there's Managers and coaches can come from all angles. There's, there's some fantastic managers from an older generation in English football. There's, there's fantastic managers who've had big playing careers. Mm. But there's also another option. And there's, there's um, coaches who've had different varying levels of playing but have studied and worked and um, developed themselves as coaches and as leaders who can also make an impact. So I think those barriers have been broken down now in, in uh, Britain. And I mm -hmm. think it's a good time to to be a young British coach. I think we've probably been behind some of the other countries in that way. I think if you look at um, the Bundesliga, for example, mm. and the ages, and um, you know, you've got Julian Nagelsmann who's managing Bayern Munich at you know, 34 years old. Whereas mm. In England, that would be unheard of <laughs> yeah. um, still. So I think they're still at a, at a level where there's a respect there and acknowledgement for um, you know, the work that, that young coaches can do. And I think um, Britain is, has made some good strides on that as well. And, and hopefully that will continue. But again, I stress it's, it's not about your pathway, your background. It's not about one thing is better than the other. It's, it's about that there's, there's, you know, different ways into the job and the, the industry is open and the job is open. And um, it's about your quality and how good you are, um, not your age or your past experiences. And um, clubs are showing that they'll give people opportunities. And then of course it's, is up to, to those of us who have the opportunities to do as well as we can and um, like those before us, hopefully mm -hmm. keep opening up those opportunities for others. Obviously you're at the mercy of the players that you have at your mm -hmm. disposal, any manager, any head coach, mm -hmm. in any football club is. Is, is, is there a common ground, and, and, I, and I say this by way of, um, not comparison, but, but to show where you're at and where you've been at. So, a Freddie Ladapo, a Marcus Harness, are they coming to you and saying, is, is this the same as what you would have done with a Cristiano? Or, you know mm. what I mean? Because as players, we're fascinated, aren't we? With yeah, yeah, yeah. The experience yeah. of where a manager's been. Yeah. Is, 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 there a, is there a straightforward way of approaching those two situations the same way? You've got players that want to be better. Is, is that mm. a straight line between the two of them, would you say? I think that's a common thread. Mm. Yeah, that, that players want to improve. And of course, if you're working with a world-class players, then there's a, a different way of trying to find that connection and... Um, trying to bring them a plan that can help them improve um, and that's probably not going to be showing them clips so much maybe of other players instantly mm. whereas at, at list level the players are really keen for that and, and any little nuggets that you can share with them on you know he, he done this uh, <laughs> or he done that it's he a great way that. of getting a yeah, buy-in isn't yeah, it yeah of course it is um, yeah it's um, 
it's, it instantly gets their attention. They, they know that you've, you've worked with some really good players. You, they know that there's little things that you can pass on. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's a, a tool in the armory. Um, but again, it's, it's one of many and you mm. need so many tools and you know it yourself. If, if a manager has one way of doing it, players can get bored very quickly. And if you're <laughs> going to sit here every day and say, um, you know, player, this player done that, this player done that, why don't you do that? This player done that, let's <laughs> look at this player. It's not going to last very yeah, long. Yeah, you know, yeah. the first time or two you do it, players would be fascinated and mm. interested. But it's, it's not the only tool. It doesn't make them feel better if they've had a game that hasn't gone their way. And yeah. again, you're going back to, well, look, let's have another look at what he does. Yeah, yeah. So you, you need a lot of different strategies, ways to connect with players, ways to help players. That's a great one to have. And it's a, a, a benefit of, of where I've coached, but it's, it's hopefully only one of the tools that we bring out of the bag. And, and just to, it's for my own interest more than anything else, when you, when you have had the opportunity of seeing world-class day in, day out, mm-hmm. like a Ronaldo, is, is he, yes, you, there's, there's the perception about him, obviously even more so in the media at this moment in time. Is he where he is because of how hard he works? I think that's the case, you know, across the board. Mm. Um, of course, to operate, I um, could mention other top players who we've seen at United over the years or even seen really up close at, mm. at Tottenham. And um, of course, there's a level of talent and a, le- a level of, of blessings from a physical <laughs> point of view that you need but I think in general when you see the and especially probably hit me working down the levels sometimes the gaps you know in a talent level aren't aren't that high and um, you know often what has made the career of a player has been you know the the mental things that you talk about the mm. the, the determination the resilience the commitment to, to chase their goals and their um, dreams, their resilience in difficult moments, their dedication, professionalism, and, and those aspects. So, um, I think it's you know it's it's absolutely the truth that nobody it's impossible to make it to that level, and certainly not to sustain it at that level mm. without having uh, amazing characteristics from a from a psychological point of view. And um, again, it's not to say that you know. Players at, at this level don't have that because there's some here who do. We have some fantastic professionals, and um, it's just about sharing some of those insights as well. Because I think you know, again, players enjoy it, and I think any sportsman, any walk of life, we all like to have role models. We mm. all like to know the ins and outs of what the people who we look up to do, so that we can try and emulate it in our own way. And um, yeah, I think working with those the players at that level, you can you can always see the the dedication that they've had to to get to where they've been. Plus, he's on a free transfer now, so you never know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Once the world goes yeah. to it. As you said, it's a beautiful place down here. I could see him settling down here, leading the line. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure it'll be top of his, his list of beautiful places. That, uh, we mean that with the greatest yeah, respect, yeah. of course, to what's going on here. At of course, <laughs> of course. And um, of course, uh, we would be more than honoured, but we're not, we're not waiting on the phone call. You, you mentioned the word honoured, and it seems to be a place, because undoubtedly, Ipswich Town is a big football club. It's a big football club that's spent, this is the fourth season in League One, a couple of decades away from the Premier League. People have seen what this club can do. They've seen the people walk through this mm-hmm. door that have led this place. Yeah. Is there a sense of legacy there? Is there a sense of history? And is that part the challenge of what Ipswich is? It is. It's, it's, um, it's a beautiful challenge, but it's, it's, part of the, it's part of the benefit and part of the challenge that yeah. I've been... Clear from the start that it's something that I really wanted to embrace, even from my perspective, the fantastic managers that have been through the door here and, and been through the door the same age as me, and you don't want any comparison with them, but it's an enjoyable, um, you know, an inspirational thing to look mm. at. And I think, again, players and staff, are, I've really wanted everyone to be aware of that, that history and that success that the club have had previously, because if they didn't, I probably wouldn't be sitting here now. You know, we're getting 28... Thousand, almost thirty thousand people following us in League One. That's staggering, isn't it? Yeah, and, it's and the away support yeah. is fanatical. Yeah, exactly, it really is, and that's not because we're playing good football in League One. Mm-hmm. That's because of uh, a generation of people who have seen this club win trophies and win mm-hmm. European trophies and be at the top end of the English game. And now, hopefully, their their children and their families are, um, you know, being told those stories and, mm-hmm. and you know inheriting that love for the club. And it's about us now giving them something new to get behind. And um, yeah, I think that that history behind us is a great benefit, but it's also a challenge because mm. 
as you say, it's the fourth season um, for the club in League One. Really, the, the team haven't been anywhere near a really serious promotion push that has sustained through the season. They've had good moments, but haven't been there or thereabouts at the business end of the season. And you know that being in League One as Ipswich Town is, is a challenge every week because for you know so many of the clubs, it's the biggest game of the season or one mm -hmm. of the biggest game of the season. It's a cup final for all the other clubs. You get players coming here on a Saturday afternoon who might be playing in front of a few thousand um, one weekend and then mm -hmm. they're playing at Portland Road in front of 30,000 and as well as an inspiration for us. At times, of course, it can be uh, a push for the other team and an inspiration for them. Mm. And if you don't handle it in the right way as an Ipswich Town player or a manager, it can be a burden mm -hmm. because you know they're coming to see Ipswich win. Um, so we, we know it's a challenge, but we embrace it you know, and we, we try and make sure that the players do as well. You know, they're all at the club for a reason. They've all chosen to be here. Mm. It's a great place to be. I've chosen to be here. The teams that we play on a Saturday, um, a lot of them would love to be here. And it's, uh, you know, it's a, a challenge that we embrace, but we do know that it, it makes it not easy. And it's why it's been difficult, not just for Ipswich Town, but also for some of the other um, historical or, or bigger football clubs in League One. Big to, ones there at to, the moment, then. Yeah, mm. there has been, and there has been over the last decade, the, mm. the likes of a Nottingham Forest or a Leeds. And, mm -hmm. um, it's not always so easy to automatically bounce back up again for, mm. for many of those reasons. So it's a challenge, but it's a great challenge. Sounds like you're thoroughly, thoroughly enjoying it. And it was, mm -hmm. as we were chatting before, it always seems like a strange thing to ask a manager. Do you love mm. it? Do, mm. you mean, do you enjoy it on a daily basis? And because all of you, there's, there's, from my point of view, having the pleasure of being able to talk to managers mm -hmm. like yourself, there is that common thread. There's the twinkle in the eye of, of you do mm -hmm. love it. And from the outside looking in at times, it looks like a very, very, very hard job, obviously mm -hmm. in relative terms. But it's there, isn't it? That passion, that love, that drive, because you are the man who has to, has to motivate anyone else. And without that, yeah. you wouldn't be able to do it, would you? Yeah, no, it is. It's, um, as you say, it's a very demanding job, sacrifices, huge sacrifices, family, friends, hours in the day. Um, long afternoons at the training ground. Long afternoons at the training ground, <laughs> speaking to yourselves. Um, but that's not the certainly not the worst bit of the job. Um, so yeah, it's there's there's huge sacrifices needed certainly to do the job how I would want to do it. But um, we also know it's a privilege. You know, you get to come in to um, work every morning. Sometimes I think you can't call it work because it's football and we love football. And you get to come in and and coach, talk, play, mm. watch football all day. So um, if you'd offered me a data at 14 years old, had I took it mm. as a job, I would say that's not a job. Mm -hmm. So um, there's, a, there's a love there, which um, is really important to try and keep hold of that. Um, it's important to have good people around you. You know, I've um, really, really delighted with the staff that I've got around me on the coaching side and um, the team that we have there is, um, you know, people who enjoy being around and, and we work hard, but we work hard together and we enjoy it. And the players and the wider staff around the club are enjoyable to be around as well. And I'll try and foster that, that environment where it is an enjoyable place to come to work. It's enjoyable to go away on trips with these boys. Mm. You know, we're all giving up time away from families and loved ones and recreations that we could be doing. So as much as we're going to do everything that we can to, to win a game on Saturday and to be successful at the end of the season, try and make it an enjoyable environment along the way so that people come to work and they've got a spring in a step and they're excited about what they might do today and they, they feel like they're seeing friends or people who care about them mm. and they're going to learn something that day or get better at something and um, it's an enjoyable, rewarding place comes to work. And we try and keep that bit of the job intact because as you said, there's so many pressures to it and you, you live or lie by yeah. your results and um, it's important not to let that be the the only overriding bit of the, the job, or else you probably wouldn't keep that twinkle in the eye, as you say. It's, it's amazing to hear the progressive way that you talk, seeing your teams play, mm. um, certainly playing a brand of football that I know, if you are a, of a purist background, you really <laughs> do enjoy watching how adaptable your teams are. Um, and there is that sense of the overarching educational side of it. Is you're obviously a very well-educated ed man, a man that's got a thirst for knowledge, both mm. personally and professionally. The last question I've got to ask though is, is if there's still a foot in the past, are you, are you Kieran or are you the gaffer? Um, you know what, it's, it's funny because people ask me that whenever they, <laughs> they came here, you know, my, my, um, my assistant might come in and say, you know, people have been asking, like, do we call you 
Kieran, or do we call you the gaffer? And I just said, everyone call me what they're comfortable with. I don't mind, you know, I'll really try and, I, I don't like to force these things. Um, I think you want people to respect you because of how you are as a person, how you treat them and, mm -hmm. and how you lead, not because you demand a certain job title or whatever. So, um, yeah, I, I've left it open. Probably most people probably <laughs> call me, call me gaffer or boss, but some call me Kieran, and if that's what they're comfortable with, I'm, I'm fine with it, and it sort of fits the, the culture that we're trying to build, really. Well, I think it's only fitting that you've invited us in, you've fed us, you've given us your time. We're in the manager's office, so I'll say thank you very much, Gaffer. It's been an absolute <laughs> pleasure. Thank you, David. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Much. Cheers.